Greetings and salutations, travelers of the internet. Welcome to the Lit Roundtable. I'm Anna. And I'm Joseph. We'll be your wise or not so wise mentors for today's audio adventure into all things storytelling. Hey there. Hello. <laughs> How's it going? It's going pretty good. Episode 11. Yeah. It's exciting. It's been a little bit since we recorded because we were in California. Yes. For a bit, visiting my wife's family and some friends. Mm-hmm. Had a wedding. Yeah. It was a good time. It, it was, was a good really little fun. vacation. It was lovely. California is mm. beautiful. If you've never been, you should go on vacation there. Yes. And see the beach. Mm. And the mountains. And the mountains. You can do everything there. You can yeah. ski and surf in the same day. Yeah. You totally could. And we didn't. A, and spend a lot of money. <laughs> yes. We got a lot of souvenirs. <laughs> we did. A lot of very nerdy souvenirs. Um, and I bought a lot of books. You did. I even got... A couple. And a graphic novel. Mm-hmm. So that's cool. Yeah. It was a great time. It was a nice little time to get away, because I realized that Hope and I, anyway, hadn't been out of Nebraska since 2019. You hadn't been to California since 2019, or 2018, maybe. Yeah. It had been too long. Mm-hmm. So, this was good. It was a much-needed trip. Yep. It was super fun. For sure. So, we are back, and we are ready to start recording some more episodes for you guys, and today we have an exciting topic. This has been long anticipated by both of us, kind of anticipated, kind of, well, we know we both have, yeah, we both have a lot to say (laughs) about the things that we hate about the Hobbit trilogy. Yeah. And that is what we're going to be going over today. Yes. So, <laughs> as well as your buckle normal, in. <laughs> yeah, buckle up, because this is going to be a wild ride. Yeah. I have a huge list on my phone of all the things. I have a smaller list, but mostly because I was getting depressed as I was writing it. Yeah. Because I love the book so much. Yeah. It just makes me sad. Mm. Yeah. So, but. we will see. And then next week, we'll go over the things that we actually did like. Yes. About the movies, so that'll be that'll be good. We'll end on a good note. Next week. Next or week. Or the, well, the next episode, anyway. The next, right, not next week. We'll probably record it next week, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see. But when <laughs> the next episode will be a lighter note. Yes. We'll, it'll be more, I don't know, less upsetting. <laughs> but, and we're also going to go over just your normal stuff, what we've been reading, watching, and uh, going over the lies of Locke Lamora. Yeah, so, chapters 14 and 15. Yeah. So, let's start with what we have been reading and writing. So, Anna, let's start writing. with you. Or, oh. or sorry, reading, watching. <gasps> You're going to ask me what I'm writing. Sure. That's new. Yeah, what are you writing? <laughs> I don't know why I said that, but we'll go with it. Just yeah, go so, it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what I've been writing, <laughs> um, I am working on a prequel book for... Um, my series of there books, and I did start writing on it again this week. So that's really all the details you're going to get. Just the fact pl- that I am writing. It was applicable. Somehow I yes. read your mind, and yeah. I knew. Funny. Um, but when I'm reading, uh, so I'm still working on Shadow and Bone. Um, for some reason, because I've read this book before, I'm not feeling like super motivated to actually read it because. Mm. I have already read it. Sure. And I, I'm not a huge rereader in general, except for, like, things that I, like, like, I've read Lord of the Rings several times, um, and I've read some Star Wars books a couple of times, and mm-hmm. um, a few other things, but generally I don't reread YA, so I think that's why I'm having some trouble with it. I may switch to audiobooks for these, so that I can get through them faster. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> um, but we'll see. Um, because I have found that YA books are easier for me to listen to when I'm like multitasking than Mm -hmm. like some bigger adult fantasies. I feel like the prose is easier, you Mm -hmm. know, like it's not as flowery text. Right. It's easier to just digest, you know, you don't have to chew. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I'm still working on that. Um, I did start listening to The Bone Witch by Rin Chupeco. The Bone Witch. That sounds metal. Um, it's really interesting. <laughs> um, so it's about your, um, like when you come of age, you become like some kind of, um, or like you develop some kind of like specialty 
and um, the main character's older brother was in the army, um, and he, this is also in a very fantasy world, um, and her brother was in the army, and he died, and at his funeral, she raised him from the dead. So she, her specialty, which she didn't know, um, is like kind of necromancy. Oh. Um, which is a type of thing, but anyway, so, and there's like, it, it's very involved and like the world is very well developed and it's super interesting. Um, that sound very interesting. It's fun. It's a, f- well, it's, yeah. I mean, it is a fun read, but there's it's parts where I'm like, oh, this is like heartbreaking. Mm. <laughs> um, but it's, it's been really good. So I'm listening to that. Um, I also started The Voyage of the Dawn Treader this week because my book club is um, in swing. So that's fun. Awesome. Yeah. And my big thing. <laughs> While we were in California, I bought a whole bunch of manga oh, for yeah. My Hero Academia. <laughs> Which um, all of the ones that I bought, we've already seen the anime episodes of. But um, I have finished all of the ones I've purchased, and I just want more of them, even though I know exactly what is going to happen, because I have seen the show. It, I mean, it, it, there are some differences, but um, I'm just like, oh my gosh, I just want more of My Hero Academia, and there aren't any bookstores around here that sell them. At least not the ones you need. Right. Like, they have them at certain stores, but it's never the ones you are looking no. for. <laughs> no. Never. Yeah. Um. So... <laughs> this whole thing but I uh so I've been reading some manga um and it's made my viewing of My Hero Academia interesting because um I had this weird moment where I went back and rewatched some of the early episodes because I had just read them and I was like wait am I watching this in Japanese or in English and I was definitely watching it in Japanese but because I had read it in English and then was watching it um my brain was like, has done a fair amount of acclimating, apparently, to listening to the Japanese. So We're going to get you to be a subbed person. I mean, I don't it's mind. It's going to be awesome. It is, I, okay, it depends on what I'm doing. If I'm just sitting down yeah. to like watch a show, it's fine that it's subtitled. You can't multitask. If I am trying to sew or do anything else <laughs> yeah. while I'm watching, I have to have it be in English so that I can just listen to it. Because that's really what I'm doing when I'm sewing and watching TV is I'm listening to TV while I'm sewing. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm reading. Do you want to do what you're reading now or do you want me to do what I'm watching? Just keep barreling through. Okay. So what I've been watching, I did watch um, Kiki's Delivery Service, which is a Studio Ghibli movie, and it's very cute. So where does it rank for you? On mm. Like, is it is it above Howl's Moving Castle? Spirited Away? No. Totoro? No, I would say that it's like a little, um, I, I don't, it was really good, but it's definitely not like my neighbor Totoro level. Yeah. That, I mean, that's a high bar. Yes. <laughs> but it's really fun. Like I would like to own it. And so Hope and I watched Kiki's Delivery Service together and we both agreed that it would be like a great movie when you're homesick from school to just like lay on your couch and watch because it's very like soothing and the music is really beautiful and it's really fun highly recommend yeah. especially if you've got kiddos oh yeah yeah all the studio Ghibli movies would be great yes yes um i did also um watch i've started watching death note which is an anime that's on netflix I love Death Note. Um, it's intense. Yeah, it is. It is. You've always said that it's more of a character study, and the more I get into it, I totally get what you're saying. Like, yeah. it's it's psychologically very interesting. Uh-huh. Um, I would not say that it's fun. <laughs> it's yeah, entertaining, no. but it's not like a fun, like, oh, I just love this show. It's like, wow, this show is making me use my brain in a way that I have not yeah. had to use it in a very long time. It's easy to binge because yeah. it's, it's addicting. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, because th- the premise for the whole thing is this this kid finds this death note, which is like a notebook that these, um, what are they? They're like, they're, they're not really, is that what they're called? Yeah. It's they're, like, they're, they're not they're like really a, demons, but no, they're like they're part like a, of the spirit realm. and Yeah. They're like a Japanese death god or something. Mm-hmm. And they have these death notes 
and they'll whoever's name gets written in the death note will die within a certain amount of time right with like the parameters that are set if you don't specify how they die they'll just die of a heart attack you can specify how they die though and this high school kid finds it and he starts trying to use it to like take out all these criminals but you have to like know the name of the person you have to know what they look like Right, because of people that have Mm -hmm. the same name. You have to be, like, picturing them in your mind Mm -hmm. when you write it. There's, like, all these rules for the Death Note, which is why it's a hard magic system. Yeah, Throwback to our magic system podcast. Go listen to that if you haven't. Um, Yeah, Death Note, I can see why you would say it's not fun, but it's, like, fascinating. Yeah. And it's very entertaining still. Mm -hmm. It's like like people that like thrillers, like psychological thrillers or crime, you know, crime... TV shows, like, it's like NCIS or X-Files. Yeah, Files yeah. Or, you know. No, totally, totally. I did try to watch Castlevania based on your oh, recommendation. Yeah. I knew you did. Here, okay, I think... But can I say what I'm going to say? Yes, I know what you're going to say, though, but say it. I tried to watch it. I watched one episode by myself, and I was like, hmm, that was a lot and I don't really care about the characters much. And then I wasn't going to probably watch any more for a long time. But then Hope was trying to watch it on the plane. Yeah. Um, based on the same recommendation from you. <laughs> and we got through the second episode, and we both looked at each other, and we were like, yeah, no. <laughs> and we stopped watching it. <laughs> so, would you like to defend yourself? <laughs> It's very popular. I'm not crazy. No, I know you're not crazy. People like it. (laughs) There wouldn't be four seasons of it if it wasn't popular. Yeah. Um, I know know it's not everything is for everyone. Right. So if it's just not your guys' cup of tea, that's totally fine. But I think of all of the seasons, the first one is by far the least compelling. Okay. (laughs) It's kind of like The Office. Oh. Ooh. But not. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Where, like, you're like, oh, like, there's moments from the first season that I remember that are, like, super cool. I'm like, whoa. But for the most part, all of the really cool moments that I love in the show are season two and on. Okay. So. Because the first episode is very bloody. Oh, yeah. Well, that's very the, violent. The, there was, like, a lot of shock factor stuff in the first episode. But then the second one is just very crude. Yeah. Like, the conversations they're having, I'm like, ugh. Yeah. Nasty that men. does <laughs> get... Um, that improves. Okay. You know. It, I don't know. I have a lot of shows I want to watch. That one might get pushed, like, yeah. very down to the bottom of the barrel if I get really desperate someday. I will say that was also kind of a turnoff for me in the first couple episodes. And I think I did take a pretty long break before I started watching it again. Mm -hmm. And then once I got through, because it was like they came out with a second season and I was like, oh, well, if they got a second season, I guess it must be pretty okay. I guess I'll finish the first season. And then I finished the first season and went right into the second season. And I was like... Oh, okay, yeah, it is. It's pretty good. <laughs> okay, okay. So, sometime. Maybe I'll revisit it. You know, no pressure. Okay. Not like the Silmarillion. There's pressure there. <laughs> yes, I know. It's right here. I have it out. Yeah. I see it all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, I also started watching Loki. That just started airing. Me too. On Disney Plus. So that was really... I'm not going to say anything else about it because spoilers, but it's mm-hmm. really good. If you like Marvel, yeah. check it out. For sure. I'd, I'd say, not spoilers, obviously, but as far as, like, rankings for the new shows that have come out, WandaVision was really good. Loki, I think, has the potential to be on par or better than WandaVision. Mm-hmm. And then Falcon and Winter Soldier just wasn't that compelling to me, so that one's third. But yeah. I think Loki's going to be really good. So, yeah. anyway. Totally agree. Um, I did also recently rewatch some Disney movies because I was sewing. So I rewatched Moana. Nice. Better than I remember. Nice. And I remembered it being pretty good. So, <laughs> um, and I also rewatched Tangled, oh, which yeah. I just love. Those are both really good. Um, and I tried to watch the live action Lion King, and I just couldn't do it. I got <laughs> to like almost where the wildebeest stampede would be, and I just had to stop because I was like, ugh, no, 
Was it like, this is garbage? Or... It was just like, it wanted to be the exact same movie. Yeah. And the original movie is so good. I was like, I could just go watch the actual movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a movie. But you know what I mean? Like, I could go watch the one that I'm feeling nostalgic for. The one where the lines actually have, like, they actually emote. Yes. And you can, like, it's just more entertaining from what I've heard. Yeah. Oh, so much more. Yeah. And it's just, and, like, they did, like, some versions of the songs, like, a little different. And I was like, ugh, the original version was better. Yeah. So I didn't make it through that whole movie. I just couldn't do it. So. That is fair. Yeah, and obviously we're watching My Hero Academia. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Yeah. But that's, that's all I've got. Cool. I feel like I just talked a lot. It's all good. Now it's my turn. Okay. Mine will be shorter. Yeah. So. You don't read as many no. volumes of books as right. I do. <laughs> so, um, for me, what I've been reading, I actually finished Lies of Locke Lamora on the plane. <laughs> I know you did. I I'm cheated. I'm so jealous. <laughs> I finished the whole thing. So I had to ask on about uh, what happened in the last chapters or yeah. the chapters that we were supposed to read just to make sure that I don't like spoil things in right. the discussion. But I have a lot of things to say about the ending, so I'm excited. Yeah. So, yes, I finished that on the plane. When we were in California, I did buy a few things. I bought the... I also bought a manga um, or manga, however you're supposed to say it. I saw a TikTok the other day from uh, an Asian speaker saying that either way is fine if you're speaking english manga is fine because it would be weird it's like when when um people that know some italian throw in like random pr- italian pronunciations of words and it just sounds weird okay so, so manga. she was like manga's fine cool so i purchased a manga <laughs> it was a uh, demon slayer i found the volume that picks up after the Demon Slayer movie, which we mm-hmm. saw, Mugen Train. So, I was able to read the events. The immediate after events. Mm-hmm. after that arc, um, like not too far, because half of the half of it was actually the stuff from the movie, and then like the last half of it was. I would say it's more falling action. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that's fair, and so. It, it did kind of just feel like an epilogue of the movie mm-hmm. that we just watched. But that was really cool, and I can't wait to buy more of them and read ahead. So I'm excited maybe about that's, that. Maybe that's what I'm trying to do with my hero, is I'm like, I just want to I want to read them so that I'm ahead of the show, yeah. so that I know you've what's got, coming. You've got farther to go. <laughs> I know. I know. I have a long way to go. Demon Slayer only has one season in a movie, so. I know. My Hero Academia has, f- uh, they're on five now. I know. So. Anyway, anyway. Um, I also got a graphic novel called Dark One by Brandon Sanderson. He is the same author of Mistborn and the Stormlight Archives and a whole bunch of other stuff. He's kind of a big name in adult fantasy right now. And um, I know he came up in our Magic System podcast mm-hmm. as well because he's he, that's like one of his main things. He loves making Magic Systems and stuff. And he made this graphic novel, I guess, well, he's the writer on it. And, like, he made the story. He's not mm-hmm. the artist, obviously. But, sure. Um, I did finish that, and that was very interesting. It's kind of about this... Um, it's a portal fantasy, which means it starts off in real life, and then you get kind of sucked away into the fantasy world, kind of like Narnia style. Mm-hmm. This is, like, kind of a dark Narnia of, like, instead of getting sucked into the world and being the hero that everyone... Is, has been, like, asking for, you know, like, the chosen one. Instead of being the chosen one, you are the dark one, where you are, you arrive, and everyone's like, oh, you are gonna bring about, like, the calamity of, yeah. like, the doom of our time. <laughs> mm. um, so it's <laughs> kind of a twist of the common trope, and yeah. I appreciate the uh, upending of tropes, you know. Right. One done well. And he, I, I trust him as an author to do it well. So Mm -hmm. it was really, it was really good. It was entertaining. It definitely was a cliffhanger. So hopefully he makes more of them. Um, so yep, that was good. What else for reading? There's, hasn't really been any new developments for me. Um, but for watching, I am on episode 90. 
seven of Critical Role. <laughs> nice. And Campaign 2 just ended. Yeah, It I actually saw that. ended on, I think they ended it at 141 episodes. So I have a finish line. <laughs> nice. And we'll see how much I can chew through before they start Campaign 3. Are they I'm actually s- doing a Campaign 3? They are. Okay. There is going to be a Campaign 3. They are, they are though, I'm really excited for this, going to do kind of a another game in between. That's just called Exandria Unlimited, which Exandria is the world that Matt Mercer created for the, the game that they're playing of Dungeons mm-hmm. & Dragons. And this is going to be like a s- six or eight episode thing, like a r- shorter story, just to kind of keep people occupied in the interim between campaigns. And this time, Matt Mercer, who DMs for um, Critical Role, is going to actually get to be a player. So, And someone else is going to DM... Uh, I forget all their names. There's like three of them that are from the Critical Role cast, and there's like three new people. One of the new people is the uh, DM. That's exciting. So, and Matt Mercer gets to be a player. So I'm excited to see him play instead yeah. of DM. Cool. Um, anyway, uh, anything else for watching? Um, oh, I did get pretty far in Jujutsu Kaisen, which is, mm. I think, an anime that I mentioned before. Mm-hmm. It's very good. Um Let's see. Although one of my favorite parts about it was the intro and uh, credit music. And I got so far that I'm in another part now and the credit music changed. And I'm very sad. (laughs) That is something that happens in anime. um, Yeah. Which is, like, that doesn't happen in, like, Western media. Like, the theme song for a show stays the the theme music, like, for the whole run of the show. But in anime, every time you get to a new arc or season, they change it. Yeah, they'll get a new song. Mm -hmm. Which... Makes me sad sometimes. Yeah. Except for Hunter Hunter, they actually kept the same song the whole time. That's true. They did. Which is good because that song the is end a song, bop. Though. Yeah, the end song always changes mm-hmm. between seasons for them. But um, yeah, so I watched more of that. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's other things I'm forgetting. Uh, for gaming stuff, we're still playing our RPG, which we're playing another session tomorrow. Oh, yeah. Tomorrow evening, um, which you guys just kind of wrapped up. Uh, or you are in the process of wrapping up this current kind of mission thing that you're doing. So we'll get to do some level up stuff tomorrow. So you get to think about what you want to buy your, or spend your sweet, sweet experience points on. I'm so bad at that. <laughs> well, you have the afternoon now to think about it. Okay. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that is pretty much it for me for new stuff. Um, what are you writing? Well, I wrote a big list of things I hated about the <laughs> Hobbit movies. But before we get to that, let's talk really quickly about Lies of Locke Lamora. Yeah. For chapters 14, 15? Yeah. What you said? Yep. Okay. I've got a I, timer. I hand the reins over to you. Timer is started. Okay. Okay. So this week we're talking about chapters 14 and 15. So chapter 14 is called Three Invitations. Um, and this is kind of like a, bra- it's like a braided essay in style because you're going between three different like events that are happening. Mm. Um, so we're following Locke as he goes to the Salvaras again and we're following right. Jean, um, as he is like, I don't really, I know what he was, he was like looking through dead bodies, but I, Maybe he was looking for, like, money. <laughs> I'm he not was, sure what he was looking for. He was masquerading as a priest of the yes. um, death goddess. Mm-hmm. And he got on to the boat, right? I don't think he was on the boat. Mm. Well, oh, no, wrong. you're right. He was in a building, like, mm-hmm. nearby and found a bunch of dead bodies mm-hmm. that I think they were killed by... Caporaza. Yeah, they had they had the piercing marks from like the falconers, mm-hmm. the scorpion falcon, so yeah. they got killed by falcon. Yes, and I forget why that was an important revelation at the time. Um, mm, I don't know. Anyway, that happens. Um, and then, uh, Caparaza also visits uh Donna Vorchenza, who is the spider. Mm-hmm. So she's the one in charge of the secret police. Um, so those are like the three storylines that you follow in this chapter. Um, Locke 
with the Salvaras is asking them for money. Yes. Because obviously they have lost all of their money. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Salvaras are like, oh, we don't have any more money right now. Things are really tight. But there's this party we're going to and you should totally come. And while we're there, we'll like make some inquiries about borrowing some money from some of our friends. We'll rub elbows. Yeah. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll help iron out this shipping issue that he manufactured. Yeah. To get more money. Right. Um, and he doesn't want to go to the party, but then he can't talk himself out of going. Like, he can't come up with a good enough reason mm-hmm. to not go with them. Um, so he ends up going to the party. But that that is covered in Chapter 15. Yeah. Which So we'll get to that. And then for Jean, he, um, while he's <laughs> looking at these dead bodies, who shows up, Joseph? The sisters. Yes. Sisters. Sisters. <laughs> yeah. The nasty kind. Yeah. Um, and so he has a big old blowout with them. Yeah. They have some fisticuffs. Oh my gosh. I liked how he fought the sisters with the wicked sisters. Yes. The name of his hatchets. Yes. Like, oh look, poetry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that was very intense. Very intense. He, they traded blows, although he took out, he, he actually took them out kind of easier than I thought he would. Cause I know we've, we've like heard about him he being is. like a really good fighter and everything. Yeah. We but, haven't really seen it though. Yeah. We didn't really know, or we couldn't really appreciate just how good he was. Cause this is the first actual, um, fight that we've gotten to read like that wasn't just like a really fast like brawl kind of situation like he actually had the hatchets and he was fighting someone else that also had a weapon you know this was like yeah all the other times we've seen him fighting it's been like flashbacks yeah to like when they were training right um so there's there's been a lot of build-up to seeing him actually get to cut loose yeah which he does but he doesn't come out unscathed no he's uh kind of on death's door yeah. As he's leaving. Yeah. They got some good hits in. They did. Um, but he came out on top. <clears throat> and then for um, the... So that's like... Okay. So the name of the episode is Three Invitations, right? So yeah. the first invitation is the Salvaras inviting Locke to this big party. I think the second invitation is supposed to be Jean inviting... I said that weird... Inviting, oh my gosh. Inviting. <laughs> inviting yeah. the two sisters to fight with him. Mm-hmm. And then the third invitation it comes from Caparaza, who forces the Don of Orchenza to invite him to this big party by using the mage. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that's very disturbing. Yeah, it was kind of creepy to read because she she was like, no, I can't do that. Like, that'll never work. And right. all this stuff, like, gave him a million reasons why that would never work and why they never did this with the old Kappa. And it, there's a reason for that. And, like, mm-hmm. we need to keep ourselves separated. Like, mm-hmm. we have a good thing going. Don't mess this up. And he was like, uh, I don't think I can wait for you to trust me. I think we're just going to do this now. And the Falconer just uses magic and forces her into submission mm-hmm. and makes her agree to invite him to the party. Yeah. Yeah. Like a weird magical brainwashing. Mm hmm. So. Yep. And then the interlude for this chapter was about the daughters of Kamor and how like the, yeah, uh, how the prostitutes of Kamor have like unionized. (laughs) Yes. So that was interesting. Yeah. I'm not sure how that's going to come. I know it's going to be important, but it has not been revealed yet how that is so important. Yeah, it's like a weird, it was, it's like just a weird story about how, you know, the prostitutes like stole the business out from under. The pimp. Yeah, they just, <laughs> they realized that they actually have all the power mm-hmm. and just decided to start taking the money for themselves. Yeah. And if any of the, if any of the other coppas or anything anyone tried to like get power back over them they would get rid of them yeah they would just fight them or stab them in the back mm-hmm. uh yeah yeah so in there's Kappa, like two in, different groups yeah. so like there's one part of the city that has like one group of them and the other part of the city has the other and then there's some middle ground where they they just don't bother each other no 
Yeah, and Kappa but, Barsavi, when he took over, was apparently very careful to not um, upset that yeah. uh, situation. Right. He he recognized them as their own thing, and he didn't mess with them. Yeah. So. Yep. <laughs> so maybe that'll maybe that'll come up uh, to bite Kappa Raza. Because I have a feeling that he just doesn't care about what was already going on. Yeah, probably not. Um, so then chapter 15 is called Spider Bite. So this chapter is all about Locke being at this big party, which is impressive. It's mm-hmm. like they're in this glass tower and there's multiple floors. And there's, when you look down, you can see like all the floors below you. There's an elevator to get up there. You can see yeah. the whole city. It's where yeah. all the rich people hang. Yes. Basically. And Locke is um, continuously fighting some like fear of heights <laughs> and like weird motion sickness. Yeah. Because you can see all this like stuff going on in this glass tower. Yeah. Um, and so he's rubbing elbows with the rich people. He runs into, um, the banker. Yeah, whose he clothes does. He's wearing, <laughs> <laughs> he's wearing the guy's clothes and mm-hmm. runs into him at the party. And the guy is mad. I can't think of what his name. I can't pronounce his name off the top of my head. Yeah. Uh, Maraggio. Yes, thank you. And I was going to say Marcuccio, and I was like, no, that's no. Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, <laughs> Maraggio. Uh, um, yeah, he like up, he like sees him in the crowd, and the lock sees him see him, and and locks internally like, oh no. <laughs> and the guy clearly has put together what's happening. And he walks up to him, or he thinks he's he's like, those are totally my clothes, and walks mm-hmm. up to him, and Locke has to totally just. Try to figure out a way to talk his way out of it. Which he does. He he manages to tell him that, like, oh, yeah, I went to a tailor and asked him, who who has the best taste here in Camor? And he said, oh, how about this outfit? This is something that, that one of the most fashionable people in the city wears. And so basically, mm-hmm. like, also, like, stroked his ego. Yes. And managed to worm his way out of... Yeah, like, confused him enough that he was like, oh, uh, okay. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Could have sworn that was my uh, jacket you're yeah. wearing, but whatever. Um, it was very entertaining. Yes. And the whole time, the Donna Salvara, Sophia, is like trying to get Locke to come meet the Donna Vertrenza, mm-hmm. who's this adult minded old lady. Yeah. But she's very popular and very rich, and everybody loves her, but she's knitting because she doesn't really like people that much. Yeah. And uh, she finally is, like, leaving Locke to go meet with her, and they run into Kappa Raza on the stairs. Yeah, like, on, passing each other on the stairs. Mm-hmm. Such a such a great, like, these are the oh, yeah. moments in, like, spy movies where, you know, like, the spies who have been, like, trying to kill each other the whole movie, like, see each other mm-hmm. yeah. in the party. <laughs> the timer's done. But yeah, we'll finish fine. this. We'll, okay. keep, we'll keep going. Uh, we're almost done. That was a great exchange. Oh, yeah. man. So good. And, and in it, Locke was like, I forget what exactly he said. He was like, have we met before? Maybe, do you have, like, sisters or something? Yes. <laughs> well, and, and, and I was then... just like, oh! Because he knows that Gene, mm-hmm. doesn't he know by then mm-hmm. that Gene killed him? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> and he's like, no, I don't have any sisters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was savage. Um, oh, no. <laughs> and then, oh, and Kaparaza asks him if he, because... Locke's whole shtick is that he's like a merchant steal, selling wine and brandy. Yeah. Brandy, and he's like, "Oh, do you deal in caskets?" Yeah. <laughs> and Locke's like, oh. "We do." <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's no, it's so good. It's so he, well written. He, oh, it's yeah. beautiful. Such witty banter. And oh, I live for those moments. The Donna Sophia's like, "What just happened?" <laughs> and he's like, "Oh, nothing." He reminded me of someone that I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so then they get to the Donna Vorchenza and Sophia's like, oh, I'm going to go get her some water. Do you need anything? And then she leaves. And so Locke is just like hanging out in this room with this old lady that's like ignoring him. And then she stabs him with a knitting needle in the back of the neck. Yep. He, he like goes to the window to look at mm-hmm. something and then gets stabbed mm-hmm. by a knitting needle, which yeah. turns out was poisoned. Yes. Um, so she wants him to talk and he's like, why would I talk? You're going to kill me. Yeah. Um, and then he has this revelation that I'm going to punch this old lady. And he clocks her right in the face. Yeah. And steals the antidote, ties her to a chair, and escapes. 
it was kind of an entertaining way to cut the tension because it's like, oh yeah, yes. this is, I mean, the lock isn't the best in a fight, but this is also an old lady. Yeah. And if she has the antidote on her, it wouldn't be hard to just. Right. Well, and she also it. revealed that she is the spider. Yeah. Which he didn't know before. Mm-hmm. So he gained a lot of information from this. This party. This yeah. party. Um, so he escapes out the window. Has and, like, to hop hops. onto an elevator. Yep. He's, like, terrified. He just sits on the elevator the whole ride down because he's so scared of heights. Uh-huh. And uh, pays off the footman at the bottom that it was just a big bird they saw jump into the <laughs> yeah the elevator. And then he pays for a ride home-ish to the area. Yeah. Um, and when he gets home, he walks in the door and he's like, Jean, you are not going to believe what just happened. But the falconer is already there. Yep. And they're... And the physiker guy and Jean are on the floor. Mm-hmm. I think Jean is, like, riding in pain. Yes. And, and the then, falconer is... Like, oh, yeah, we have some interesting things to discuss. And then the chapter ends. Yep. I'm like... <gasps> and I really wanted to keep reading, but I knew that you had already finished it. So I was like, no, I have to stop so that we don't accidentally go into the next chapter. Yeah. I've read it. So, <laughs> yeah. So next week will be our last week talking about the lies of Lachlan Mora. Oh, because it's the last chapter and epilogue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm very excited. Ooh. <laughs> I know. It's going to be really good. I'm pumped. And then we're going to read um, The Dragons of Autumn Twilight. I'm very excited for that, So too. if you haven't already and you want to read along with us, go get your copy of that book. Yep. So. Cool, cool. All right. Here we go. Um, the actual subject. We talked a lot for the other stuff because we hadn't gotten to talk about this stuff yeah. really a lot. We've been gone for a while. So, okay. We're going to talk about all the things we hate about the Hobbit movies because we love the book. And oh, the movie so left... Uh, something to be desired. Okay, so we're going to go over all three of them, or try to anyway. Yeah. Um, if it looks like this has to be a two-parter, so be it, but we're going to do our it best. It might need to be. We will do our best to make this a uh, a one-and-done thing for the things that we hate about it. So my first thing was three movies. Ah. Uh, really? Yeah. One book. That was shorter than all the other Lord of the Rings mo- mm-hmm. uh, books. And you stretch this thing into three movies. Mm-hmm. And I get that there's content from the appendices that they pulled from, which I'm fine with. Mm. Like, mm. I'm okay with you wanting to explain why Gandalf goes away all the time and, like, where he goes and whatever. But I know I know you would have preferred it be more of, like, a, a just stick to the script kind of thing. Here's the deal. If you're going to take three movies to do it, you better get... Everything from the original source material that is yeah. pertinent in there. All that better be square. And then if you've still got time, whatever, throw some of the extra stuff in. They did not have the original book square. No. And they no. added in a bunch of garbage. Yeah. And I mean that. Yeah, we'll get there. So <laughs> that's my first thing that I hate. Three yeah. movies, really. We'll just go movie by movie. I'll, I'll list oh. all the things... From I did not do that. That's fine. I'm gonna list all the things on my list for the first movie, and can then I, you, or can you I do. I have like one very overarching thing. Yeah, yeah, go for it. And then we can go into like movie by movie. Okay. Um, tone. Right. So the Hobbit book is tonally totally different from the Lord of the Rings movies on purpose. Yeah. It's a children's book. The Lord of the Rings books are not children's books. They're epic fantasies. Everyone knows that The Hobbit is a children's book. It's very lighthearted. They go through some, like, very challenging things. But there's, like, humor throughout the entire thing. Mm-hmm. And you, Tolkien does not linger on the hard things. Like, yeah, they're in a... They end up in the trees that are on fire with the wolves at the bottom. But they're but Gandalf turns the pine cones into firecrackers and throws them at the wolves. And then the eagles come and save them. Yeah. Like, that's... That's how The Hobbit is written. But the movies are so dark. Mm-hmm. They're not... That, there's some humorous elements. But the tone is just, like, gritty and dark and... Yeah. Not at all what The Hobbit should have been. And it just makes me sad. And even looking at 
the the end of the Hobbit with the Battle of Five Armies mm-hmm. in the third book. Oh, Bilbo's yeah. unconscious for most of it. Yeah, he gets hit in the head, and, and then, then he, he wakes, wakes up, up afterwards. And we they tell him what happened very we briefly. Act, we don't actually see all the trauma. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, not at all. we don't have to watch Thorin and feeling Kili die. <laughs> right. Not so in the movies, and the we'll get to that later on too. But the extended edition of the third movie is rated R. Right, which did not it the rating that it got was totally deserved. Yeah. So don't misunderstand me there, but it did not need to be done that way. No. At all. No. It was, it was like Peter Jackson was going back to his roots of doing horror B movies. Like I guess. Why did you feel the need to kill so many orcs in so many creative and disgusting ways? I don't know. It. it yeah. I don't know. It's just. Ugh. But anyway, um, another okay. So tone. That's yeah. Your big that's thing. my big thing. Now we can go through. So specifically for the first movie, an unexpected journey. Oh, I guess I have some overarching things too that I'll go over really quick. One was three movies, really. Two, it wasn't made by New Line Cinema. It was Warner Brothers. Mm. So I think that, I think changing studios between yeah, did not do them any favors. There was also a lot of turmoil around who was going to direct them. Right. It was originally going to be Guillermo del Toro. And then he stepped away and Peter Jackson had to step in. And I'm pretty sure it's documented that he did not want to. Yes. And it gave the poor man an ulcer. Yeah. So, like, that really sucks. And I wish that he could have done what he wanted to do. Because I'm sure, you know, after Lord of the Rings, he's like, how am I going to top that? You know? And he... I guess. You know, I do feel bad for him. But there are some decisions. Yeah. It just, it feels like not as much heart and soul went into these as the Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. You know? I don't know. That's just my impression. Um, So, yeah. Those are my big overarching things. Um, I mean, there's other political things, too, with, like, there was there was a bunch of stuff about how much uh, work these movies bring in for New Zealand, and mm-hmm. there was a lot of stuff, there was a lot of drama about Warner Brothers wanting to bring people over instead of hiring in New Zealand, and so there was, yeah, there's a lot of drama there, too. I don't know enough about it to get into it fully, but... Right. There was drama. There right. was a lot of behind-the-scenes drama. Well, and there was script drama, too. Like, yeah. Guillermo del Toro had a script for two movies. Yeah. Um, and then Warner Brothers, like, made Peter Jackson use those scripts as much as he could. So, like, I... Okay. Yes. We'll extend a little bit of grace for weird, um, like... Weird script things. That were totally brought on by production house issues. Yeah. There are some things that I have listed down that I'm sure were things that uh, Warner Brothers wanted that mm. were not necessary. Okay. So, um, yeah. Anyway, there was a lot of behind-the-scenes drama, which I'm sure fed into a lot of the things that we're about to talk about. Yeah. A lot of my issues are, like, writing, plot, and things that just kind of break the lore, which mm-hmm. it's like we are talking before. It's like you can't know too much about the middle earth lore stuff right, and go in <laughs> and go into watching the hobbit because it'll mm-hmm. ruin it for you because it's like so many things are not accurate and it seems like a lot of the changes were made were totally unnecessary okay so my first thing was the elf versus dwarf drama in the prologue of the movie uh. so the prologue is basically smog attacking erebor the lonely mountain and all the dwarves are running out of the mountain which we see our first glimpses of female dwarves, which right. I thought was awesome. And yeah. I was like, oh, hey, cool. And then immediately followed a thing that I actually enjoyed with the elves showing up on the top of the hill and like this manufactured drama of they could have helped, but they didn't. And right. so acting like this was the start of all the beef with the dwarves and the elves. And I'm in the theater like, what? Yeah. Yeah. That beef goes back to, like, when the elves first discovered the dwarves. They didn't mm-hmm. know what the dwarves were and hunted them. Well, it goes even further back than that, technically. If you're talking about, like, the creation story of Middle-earth and how the dwarves were created out of turn. Yeah. And then... Technically first. Yes. And then we're like, they had to just hibernate, basically, in the mountains. Yeah. <laughs> while other things were happening. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there's just 
You can't try yeah. to pin all of the elf dwarf drama on Thranduil, no. the elf king of that time, and Thorin. And there was... The elf king of Mirkwood, specifically. Right. Right. Which just reminded me of another thing that I have to gripe about later on when we get into Battle of Five Armies. So, okay. um, um... Yeah, no, that bothered me, too. Um, I, I kind of... I feel like they wanted to, like, make a nod to Gimli and Legolas's feuding in The Lord of the Rings. Yeah, they wanted to try to build that up to make that an even bigger deal, you know? Right. Um, which was unnecessary. <laughs> but they, yeah, they could have totally just not done that whole thing. So, mm-hmm. um, and there's other stuff that I think they were trying to play off of later on with Thrandall being after a necklace in the last yes. one, which is a Silmarillion thing. But anyway, um, not enough dwarf beard. Yeah. Was my next thing. So all of the dwarves are too young, attractive, and beardless. <laughs> true, true story. Where in the books, they've all got to, like, tuck their beards into their belts, you know? Yeah. I was expecting them to all be, like, different variations of Gimli. Like, I understand the challenge of trying to... You've got a huge cast. There's 13 of these dwarves. Mm-hmm. you got to try to make them each look different and identifiable on screen. Yeah. <clears throat> so, one way to do that, I guess, is to get creative with the hair and makeup. Right. But... But it's like a well-known fact that Tolkien talks about at length. Yeah. That the length of a dwarf's beard is like synonymous with how he's respected. It's a status symbol. Yeah. They're called the long beards. Yeah. Like, that's come on, Thorin's beard. It's just like it's shorter than my beard that I have right now. <laughs> right, and Thorin's beard in the book is like the longest beard. Yeah. Because he's the chieftain of this group. And he's also way older in the book. Yes. Um, but I'm, don't I'm, get me wrong. Richard Armitage, thank you. No, I love you're Richard Armitage. You're a beautiful Armitage. human. You did a great job. But you are too young and attractive. And he wanted to have a bigger beard. Yeah. Good. <laughs> and I remember in the behind the scenes stuff, he wanted a bigger beard. Yeah. But whatever. And Philly and Kelly, it was like they were supposed to be like the hot dwarves and then the funny dwarves. Like that's right. that's totally how they grouped them. Which Thorin, like Philly and Kelly are supposed to be much younger. Yeah, they're I think the youngest. Yeah. And they're his nephews, mm-hmm. but they could have had at least bigger beards because they had yes. practically nothing. Um, yeah, so more beard. Also, later on in the movie, so yeah, there's, you know, the classic stuff. The dwarves show up, get Bilbo to go on this adventure with them. They leave, and then they manufacture so much stuff on the way to Rivendell that did not need to be there. Right. Orcs Mm -hmm. shouldn't show up until Goblin Town. Yeah. But there were orcs chasing them on wargs in broad daylight. Yes. Which they make a big deal in in the movies for Lord of the Rings about how seldom do orcs travel... Out in the open under the sun. That was the, that's what the big deal with the Urukai was because yeah. they were like this next level orc that Saruman created that could handle the sunlight. Yeah. Because the Mordor and Misty Mountain goblins and orcs could they, not. They hate the sunlight. So it like burns them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no and Or at least orcs. severe discomfort. Like they, the they really don't like the sun. So the orcs just running around in day in, in daylight makes mm-hmm. no sense and is a big uh, deviation from the lore and not even like the not even like source material but from things that are already established you know mm-hmm. like if if they d- hadn't really talked about that in the lord of the rings it'd be more forgivable but it was like a big point you mm-hmm. know for why the urukai were so much more deadly you had to be afraid of them in day well so, and well so like if it wasn't three movies they wouldn't have needed to bad that filler yeah no um somehow though the first movie ended up being genuinely boring yeah. Even with all of that extra stuff happening. Because it took so long, one, to get out of the Shire, mm-hmm. and two, to get to Rivendell. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it all took way too long. I'm going to admit something. Hmm. So I, I saw this movie in theater twice. The second time. You fell asleep? I fell asleep. Before I almost, they got to Rivendell. I was so excited for this movie, and I think I almost fell asleep the first night. Yeah. I when, didn't sleep for very long, but it was like, oh man, this is like dragging. 
And I hated that I was so tired in the theater for this mm-hmm. movie that I've been so excited for. Yeah. I was like, why does this make, why is this movie putting me to sleep right now? Yeah. But, um, yeah, that was rough. Also, um, all of this stuff, this is more orc stuff. Azog should be dead. Yes. So they have this big flashback of the Battle of um, Azanbul Zabar or something. It's like, I it's this, this crazy dwarf name. So there was a war between the dwarves and the orcs, which c- came to a head outside of the gates of Moria, which is a real thing that happened. And what happens in the lore, though, is that Thror shows up at Moria, gets killed by Azog and the other orcs in Moria because he didn't know that there were orcs there. And then Thorin shows up in response to that to fight the orcs there Mm -hmm. and kills Azog and avenges his grandfather. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. And Bolg is sired from Azog and then has a grudge against Thorin. And that's leads to the Battle of Five Armors when Bolg shows up. You know, right. so which that you have motivation for a villain for an orc villain, right? I don't know why they felt the need to keep Azog around, right? Because Bull in the book legitimately does not show up or come up until the Battle of Five that, Armies. Yeah, that's it. But it's like if they were going to bring in a big bad orc character early, which they shouldn't have done. But if they were going to do that, I don't know why it was Azog, and also his CGI was terrible. He was yeah. he was called the Pale Orc, and he was just this big, pale, shiny bodybuilder looking dude. It was. So one weird. of my yeah one of my overarching issues with these movies is the CGI that they had to use for the orcs because the costume design that they came up with was not sustainable in like the way that they had done the prosthetics in the previous movies, um, and instead of like just going back to the way it had worked previously, they were like ah we'll just do CGI for all of them. And it looks like a video game. Yeah, it's rough. It's so bad. I think another part of it was, this is another thing, uh, this was also during the big fad of 3D movies. Right, And That's true. And Peter Jackson was trying to do this big, oh, this is going to be 40... Oh, yeah. It was, two, set, some, it was some, shot some, on those oh, fancy red cameras or whatever. On red epic cameras. Yeah. And, and it was going to be in like over 40 frames a second. And... Um, in 3D, this would be like the most hyper-realistic experience for any movie ever, but you can only see it in IMAX that way. Everything else is just normal. So I think that probably also factored into the lack of practical effects and more CG, because maybe it was more difficult to make the practical look good with that. This is this is one of the occasions where technology advancing does not help. Yeah, no. Which I would have rather they kept the practical effects mm-hmm. and, and just done it the old way. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, because the Lord of the Rings movies hold up. Even, like, the practical effects and oh, then yeah. holds up. Even today. Like, you don't have to shoot it on film. No, you can still shoot which it they digitally. didn't. They shot digital, right? But Maybe it was film. For Lord, oh, because the, for it was Lord the of the Rings, it was film. It was yeah. film. But for, So for these, I get you want to shoot it digitally, but I, the practical effects were just so much better, and the CG was so not convincing. It was just... Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Particularly the orcs. Yeah. Because... The smog CGI is actually like oh that's outstanding fantastic. and fantastic. Golem, Golem was even better. Yes. Than he was. Totally you know. agree. Smog the and orcs. Golem, the orcs were bad. Mm-hmm. Um, and the spiders were actually pretty good mm-hmm. later on. Yeah, it's just the they're orcs. spiders. Um, it's because the orcs are humanoid. It's yeah. hard to do. But like, yeah, anyway, Azog should have been dead. Should never have even came up in these movies. Bolg should have been the big bad evil guy for the orcs the whole time. Is my gripe. Um, the Witch King shows up in the first one briefly to attack Radagast. This is, like, really specific, but as soon as he popped up, I was like, what? Because Radagast is exploring Dol Guldur because one of his animals is dying and poisoned or something. I don't know. There's this weird thing. And the Witch King pops out of a rock and tries to stab him with a Morgul blade, which somehow was real and didn't dematerialize when the Witch King dematerialized. When Radagast hit him with his staff. But the Witch King was all white and, like, you know, ghosty. ghosty, Which was the way that Frodo saw them when he put the ring on at Weathertop. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a difference between when you see them like that and when you see them normal. Mm 
mm-hmm. which I would have been like, okay, so they're trying to kind of like blur the lines. Like maybe that's just the way the Witch King looks when he's not in like the visage of like the white or the black like cloak and everything. Sure. But then later on in Battle of Five Armies, when the White Council shows up to save Gandalf, they look totally different from that. They look like weird, ghosty, spirity. Like they're not all white and blue, shiny with, you know. Hmm. So it's like there's just no consistency with what the Nazgul look like and when. So that bugged me, but that's really nitpicky. I understand why some people would not care about that. But... I had honestly forgotten about that. So <laughs> I'm going to admit that I haven't watched these movies in a long time because they make yeah. me hurt. But yeah. um, I will rewatch them before we do the things that we love about them because I'm going to need more help remembering what yeah. I liked. <laughs> yep. And my next thing, there were so many cartoonish moments in Goblin Town of... Like, just weird um, things that is It was kind of like Jack Sparrow riding a bank vault through a city, mm. you know? Like, that level yeah. of, like, absurd things that should have killed everyone involved and should not have worked. Yeah, I suppose that's true. Um, um, Goblin Town actually didn't bother me as much as some of the other stuff did. Because yeah. it was goofy. It was just them escaping. I liked the yeah. I liked the weird goblin song. Mm-hmm. The yes. great the great goblin was I think pretty spot on for what he was supposed to be. Just yeah. disgusting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 I I didn't hate everything about Goblin Town. Just no. some of the weird stuff that the happened they when they were yes. escaping. And um, but you skipped over Rivendell. And because they. The dwarves go to Rivendell before they end up in Goblin Town. They do. Um, yeah, I guess there wasn't a ton that I hated about Rivendell. I just thought it was annoying. I thought the dwarves were super annoying. I was like, you're supposed to be the good guys here, but I am not rooting for you. They just made them the worst house guests ever. Yes. So, yeah. But Okay, carry on. Um, but you're right. Uh, Rivendell does happen, but I'm... I'm only focusing on the things that I hate, so I'm going to jump around a okay. lot. Okay. So, um, and then immediately after Goblin Town, um, there's them getting chased by the wolves and the orcs up the trees, you know, right. which should have just been wolves, but there are orcs there too, because they've been there before, so I guess they had to bring them back. But then, um, and Gandalf does the cool pine cone thing, fine, mm-hmm. the eagles come in to rescue them, Cool. You would think this would be a fine sequence that I wouldn't have any issues with. Except for the fact that there's orcs there and there should have been orcs there. But whatever, I can kind of forgive that. But what I can't forgive is that the the music that plays when Thorin walks across a tree to dramatically confront Azog is the Ringwraith music. You're right. What? It's the Ringwraith theme from Fellowship. Why is that music playing? A dwarf is about to fight an orc. Why is there ring wraith music playing? And it's complete copy paste. Like the music had been so good, and I had loved all. The, like the music is gonna br- come up in the things that I love yes. about these movies because Howard Shore is amazing. But that sequence, the music that they just slapped in, was just the ring wraith theme, and it was just for like a dramatic battle music, you know. But, Ugh, weird. I forgot all about it that. It sounds like they just copied and pasted it. So either Howard Shore just didn't know that scene was going to happen and didn't write music for it, so they had to slap something in. Mm-hmm. Or maybe they didn't have time to write music for it, so they had to slap something in. But I was just like, that totally sucked me out of that scene. Even the first time I watched it in the theater, I was like, why is this Ring Wraith theme song playing? Like, I get how someone who isn't a super fan wouldn't notice that and would just think it's dramatic music, but, like... But I feel like they do so many things assuming that everyone's a super fan. Yeah, like... So why would you choose right then to forget that? Yeah. Because you're so intentional with everything else. With Mm -hmm. all of the music, you're always so intentional, and there's always a reason why the music is doing what it's doing. Mm -hmm. And then that just was obviously... Just an example of music that got shoehorned in, which yeah. had no good reason to be there. Hmm. So, and that was everything I hated about um, An Unexpected Journey. Because they don't make it to Bayorn yet. No. Okay. That's the next one. So that's the Desolation of Smaug, 
Which, when they uh, escape on the eagles from the trees and the orcs and everything, then immediately, like, the first thing that they're doing in Desolation of Smog is trying to get to... Well, they're trying to get to the Lonely Mountain, obviously, but they're getting, they end up getting chased by a bear. Which, mm-hmm. you know, if you haven't read the book, you don't know what that is. But they're getting chased by a bear. They get chased into someone's house in the middle of nowhere. And, um, yeah, it ends up being Bayorn, who's a character in the book. He's mm-hmm. a skin changer. He mm-hmm. can change between a, a big strong man or a big strong bear. So He's like one of my favorite characters. He's like a werewolf, only a bear. So, cooler. <laughs> he is very cool. Um, and very hospitable. No, he's so a great that... dude. <laughs> um, they, I think, they, like, kind of tried to do the dwarves introducing, but it was very, like, condensed and still not quite the same as the book, at least in the extended edition. I think in the theatrical it was even worse. Like Yeah. But because it's such an iconic scene in the book, like that's one of my favorite scenes in the book is Gandalf yeah. like trying to slowly be like, actually, by the way, you're gonna have uh, thirteen house, fourteen house guests. Sorry. Because yeah. I remember in the movie they do have a moment where it's like Gandalf keeps making gestures and they keep thinking he's signaling them to come out and then they do, mm-hmm. and then Beorn's like, oh, and what six dwarves? A troop, <laughs> and then yeah, and then. There's another gesture, then, like, all of them come out, and there's, like, all 13, and Bayorn's like, uh. Right. But it, like, they tried. I'll give them credit for trying, but it's still not quite the same. Yeah. But Before we started recording, there's, there's an, I can't remember exactly when it is, but there is another scene in the movie where they basically do that whole thing correctly. Yeah. But they give it to someone not Bayorn. And I can't remember if it's, like, at the very beginning with Bilbo or if it's at Rivendell. I don't know. When I rewatch, I'll, I'll mention it. Yeah. But, um, which is just too bad because that scene in the book is just so good. Yeah. So funny. So after Bayorn's house, they leave and go to the, it's the elf path in Mirkwood. And they they have to go down this path through Mirkwood. Mm-hmm to get to the other side of Mirkwood because going around would take way too long and they're on a time crunch to get to the Lonely Mountain at a certain time. Right. According to the map that they got in the first movie. You yes. Know, to see the keyhole for yes. the secret entrance. It's this mm-hmm. whole thing. Um, which is from the book. Mm-hmm. Um, they go in. I like how Bomber... Didn't Bomber... Yeah, he actually falls into the river and they have to carry him. Yes. And he's the biggest, fattest dwarf. Mm-hmm. So I was like, ha they actually did that. So that was yeah. from the book, so that was cool. Yeah. Um, and then the uh, spiders happen. They all get captured by spiders. And Bilbo uses the ring and cuts them loose. And then they've got all these... Instead of... I feel like... I don't remember exactly how it goes down in the book. Did elves come in and kind of rescue slash capture the dwarves immediately after the spiders? No. So No, so what happens in the book is they're, like, all kind of discombobulated from yeah. this attack, and they see a light in the forest, and they're like, oh, someone there will be able to help us. So they go to the light, and they, like, stumble into this big party that's happening. It's the right. elves. And then as soon as they, like, stumble into the light, everything goes dark, and yeah. the elves move to a different spot, and they try to have their party again. And then the dwarves just, like, keep following them into their light until the elves are like, we're done. You're, <laughs> You're coming <now>. with us. <laughs> yeah. Quit ruining our party. <laughs> you are under arrest. So. Um, okay. Yeah. That's in the how movie, it in the, in the movie though. So in the book, Bilbo has to like rescue all the dwarves from the spiders by himself and kill mm-hmm. the spiders, you know, but in the movies, the elves come in and totally steal Bilbo's thunder. <laughs> yeah. And the elves end up killing almost all the spiders. Mm-hmm. Um, which one of them is Legolas. Which I don't care. I don't. I don't mind. His that he's inclusion in it. doesn't bother me because he would have technically been there. Yeah, that's. He's not actually mentioned in the book, but yeah. But that's just because I don't think his character had been invented yet. No. Um, but canonically, Legolas would have been there. Mm-hmm. You know, and we're introduced to Tauriel, a female elf. Which right. You know, I'm cool with them introducing more female characters, especially mm-hmm. in a series of movies where the cast of, like, the main cast of adventurers 
is 13 dudes. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. there's too much testosterone up in here. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm cool with them bringing in more female characters. For sure. Um, but the thing that I hate, which I think this came down from the studio. I don't okay. think this was a writer's decision. Um, they threw Tauriel in a love triangle with Legolas and Kili the dwarf. Yeah. Which Legolas and Tauriel having having a thing, you know, whatever. Why couldn't that have just... This is also something that I hate, like what you're talking about right now. Yeah. Um, why couldn't they just have, like... Yeah, Legolas has, like, a girlfriend. Well, I mean, not using those words, but, like... Yeah, he has a That would have been totally another. fine. Yeah. And it he would have raised have... the stakes for the Battle of Five Armies yeah. if, if we're worried about Legolas's significant other. Right. You know? But they had to make it a weird love triangle. Which is not one of the about. dwarves. Which was just, you know, I guess turned into more beef for Legolas for not liking dwarves. So it was like a bunch of stuff of them trying to manufacture reasons for Legolas and Gimli not to like each other in Fellowship, basically. Right. So it's super weird. Um... Also, Legolas steals Orcrist and never gives it back until Battle of Five Armies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which is not from the books. Um, also, Tariel has, like... This will come up later, too. But she, probably more in the next one. But she has, like, healing abilities. Oh, yeah. We're going to go all into that. Okay. Okay. Well, um, we'll pause on that, then. Yeah. Yeah. What? Okay. <laughs> anyway. Um, so they get captured by the elves, right? Uh, the elves are talking to the dwarves. Thranduil has an emotional moment. Uh, well... Thorin says something to him in Dwarvish, which was offensive. And Thranduil freaks out and gets all up in his face and says, Don't speak to me of dragon fire. I know it's wrath and ruin. Because Thorin was just roasting him for not helping them when the dragon attacked. <sighs> Whatever. Stupid. Thranduil's face just like morphs. And all of a sudden his face is like half skeletal. Like he's mm-hmm. like a burn victim. Mm-hmm. But then Makes it goes no away. Sense. Then it goes away. And it's like... Okay, that's fascinating. I'm interested. Why is this like a glamour thing? Is he just like making his face look pretty even though it's not because he's like a victim of a dragon attack? When would a dragon have attacked him? I don't know. And also elves don't have that ability. Yeah. So I'm like, are you turning this into a new weird elf magic ability thing? Mm -hmm. And there's people online had been like trying to figure out what the heck that was about. And it's never brought up. Not even in the extended version. And... And it's never mentioned again. They never resolve it. Ever. It's just a weird thing that happens, and then you have to just kind of let it go. Mm-hmm. And, like, I want to know more about that. I don't, because I can tell that it's just something that they made up for drama, and I'm... But Thranduil, if you actually know Thranduil's backstory, the dude's got enough drama. For sure. Because <laughs> he was actually there at the Battle of the Last Alliance from mm-hmm. the prologue and Fellowship, where they take on Sauron, and the mm-hmm. ring gets cut off. Thranduil and his dad Orpher were there, um, but Orpher decides to charge early because he was an arrogant jerk and gets killed. So Thranduil's dad died in that fight, along with most of the Mirkwood elves. It would have been so much more compelling for them to make a reference to that instead of manufacturing... This weird dragon thing. Yeah. I don't think Thranduil would have ever seen a dragon Mm -mm. before Smog. So yeah, that was weird, and it never gets resolved. So it could have been a thing that I loved, but it turned into a thing that I hate. And the dwarves escaping kind of happens. Like, you know, Bilbo is invisible and there's a jailbreak. They, they ride away on the barrels. Here's where the thing comes in that I hate again. Random orc attacks for no reason. The orcs attack the dwarves while they're on the river. And... And oh. somehow the elves haven't taken care of it before then. Or the spiders. Well, I'm just even. like, somehow the elves didn't know that there were orcs <laughs> right on their back door. Yeah. Like, the orcs aren't that good at stealth, are they? No. <laughs> like, come on now. Also, it's daytime! It's broad daylight! <laughs> Why yeah. are there orcs here? And we got to see Bomber the Barrel Tank. Do you remember this? <laughs> yes. What the heck? The dude gets, like, springboarded out of the water, tramples, like, 50 orcs in a barrel, and then his arms pop out with some weapons, and he, like, spins around a bunch and takes out a bunch more orcs before hopping in someone else's barrel. Which, like, he would never fit in someone else's barrel. It's just, like... It's just, bomber. Just comical. Just... Just... 
absurd, absurdly cartoon, which, which goes back to the tone thing. Yeah. Like, like if you wanted it to be a super cartoony kids movie, cool. But there's just so much whiplash. We just mm-hmm. we just heard about Thranduil's. We just saw Thranduil's scarred up face. We just saw Thranduil decapitate an orc earlier on while they were interrogating him. You know, we're seeing creepy spiders attack attack people. Uh, there's there's during this. Gandalf went away and has been doing crazy stuff in Dol Guldur, like fighting the necromancer, which... We'll get to that. Whatever. Like, I don't hate that, so it's not on my I list. Do. But you do, so we'll talk about it. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, so there's just so much tone issues. So, okay, they're going down the river, but while this is happening... So you mentioned, like, cartoony things. Yeah. Um, when I mentioned tone, like, The Hobbit is very comical, yeah. But it is very, like, subtly done. Uh-huh. It doesn't feel like Tolkien is, like... It's not like an episode of Bugs Bunny or something. Yeah. Which is what some of this, like, barrel fighting feels like. It's like, oh, this is like the Roadrunner or something. Um, which is just weird. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Maybe we'll cut this into... I think... So, since it is getting pretty long on time, we'll cut this into two. Probably... Um, just where they should have cut the movie into if they were going to do two parts, <laughs> which yeah. is them escaping from the elves and arriving in Lake Town. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, the, the dwarves, which I think that Peter Jackson actually said that was where the original cut was. Mm-hmm. The Barrels Out of Bonds chapter, like right after that, and when they're about to arrive in Lake Town is where he was going to cut it. Mm-hmm. So, um, which would have made sense. Yeah, that would have made sense. It should have just been two movies. I would have been fine with two. Three mm-hmm. was a stretch. Um, in this attack, um, Keeley is shot by an arrow, mm-hmm. which they I think they go out of their way to say that it's a Morgul arrow. Which makes zero sense. It was because... an orc that shot it. Mm-hmm. The reason that Frodo got so messed up by the Morgul blade in Fellowship is because it was a ring wraith mm-hmm. blade and would have turned him into a wraith eventually. Mm-hmm. Because they're ring wraiths. Why would an orc have a Morgul arrow that would do that? It makes no sense. No. Orcs can't do what ring wraiths do. And they're they're not as sophisticated as the no. ring wraiths are. At all. Like, you want to say that it was just poisoned? That's cool. You can yeah, just say that it was poisoned. Sense. That would actually make sense. Orcs would definitely poison their arrows. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, Keeley being poisoned by an arrow, that's totally fine. Also, it's not, though, because it was just there to manufacture more drama and to give Toriel an opportunity to be Arwen. So, here's what... So, they get... To, uh, we'll get into that when they get into Lake Town, because that's for later. But it's dumb. So, we'll get there... Next time. Yeah, we gotta stop. Um, We're getting too long. While all of this is happening, Gandalf is also in Dol Guldur, and he finds Thorin's dad, who's gone insane, and figures out that the necromancer is really Sauron, and Sauron like imprisons him. Which the whole fight with the necromancer versus Gandalf is pretty cool. I think it was too long. Like it's pretty much just a bunch of weird back and forth between Gandalf's light and the necromancer's dark energies. Mm -hmm. I feel like the back and forth went for too long. But it was still cool. Yeah, I guess um, I don't have an issue with that. It's more of what comes from that that I have an issue with. Yeah, which we'll get to when we Next talk time. about Battle of Five Armies. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I thought that the scene where it's revealed that the Necromancer of Sauron was actually really cool. Because you get to hear his theme music and he turns into the flamey eyeball. Which, mm-hmm. I mean, the even the flamey eyeball isn't really canon with Lord of the Rings. Like the books. It's not, but it's it's still cool because it's established for the movies. So, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, I mean, the Eye of Sauron is a real thing, like a a real like emblem that they yeah, use. Yeah, but I don't think it's it's I don't think it was supposed to be a physical like he wasn't no. actually a giant eyeball. No, you know? no, no, no. But anyway, that's the whole other thing. So yeah, uh, that's where we'll pause for the things that we hate about the Hobbit trilogy. <laughs> So, so much for getting this into one episode. Yes, it wasn't going to happen. We talked too much about the things that we were doing. Um, but when we split up and do the read-along in a separate video, we would have had more time. So, right. 
Um, okay. Next time we will talk about the back half of Desolation of Smog um, when they get to Lake Town and all of the dwarf versus smog stuff that was pointless and all of the craziness that is the Battle of Five Armies, which makes no sense unless you watch the extended edition, which is rated R. So you have to force yourself to watch all the gruesome orc deaths yeah. for it to make sense. So that's yeah. fun. We'll talk about it, though, in the next podcast. <laughs> yeah. I'm excited. <laughs> it's kind of fun to, like, tear it apart, finally. Yeah, it's fun to complain. So but hopefully there, you guys find it entertaining, There too. are things that I do genuinely like. So once we get to the... Oh, yeah, for we'll sure. We'll plenty to talk about for the things we like, too. We'll rip it to shreds, and then we'll talk about the few diamonds in the rough that... Yes. You know, like Martin Freeman's acting. Mm-hmm. And Golem. Yeah. yeah. So... We'll get there, though. But for now, I think that'll do it for today. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Go read something cool. Go watch something cool. Go do something you like. Yeah. We'll catch you next time. Bye. Bye.